Thank you for being here at the Melrose Park Stormwater Management System webinar today, Tuesday, June 13th at 7 p.m. Uh, we're going to get started with the webinar. We wanna be respectful of people's time. And so we're going to get started. My name is Nancy Gassman. I'm the Assistant Public Works Director in charge of sustainability for the city of Fort Lauderdale. Today, I am joined by other staff, including the Public Works Director, Alan Dodd, the Stormwater Operations Manager, Marie Pierce, our stormwater engineer who has been working on the Melrose Park neighborhood. His name is Elkin Diaz. And Stefan Peritano is joining us. He'll be moderating your questions as we go through the webinar. Please note that the webinar is being recorded and it'll be available on the city of Fort Lauderdale's YouTube channel um, in a day or so. Our agenda for today is to provide you with a presentation um, to serve a number of the goals, and I'll go through those in just a minute, uh, and then to leave as much time as possible for questions so that we can uh, help, help you understand how your drainage system works. And so that's our number one goal for today's webinar is to explain to you how the drainage system works so that you can be better informed when you see changes uh, in your neighborhood in terms of ponding water. We also want to set your expectations for the level of flood protection that is designed into every system in the city of Fort Lauderdale. We're going to dis discuss a little bit about why some of the storms in the past year caused floodings and others did not. Describe some of the maintenance activities specifically related to the Melrose Park drainage ditch. And then we'll talk a little bit about some actions that residents can take to reduce the potential flooding. If you're new to this format, um, at the base of your screen, there's a Q&A portion where you can put in questions. And these are the things that Stefan will be um, tracking as we go through the presentation. We will not be asking questions during the presentation. And then if you don't wanna put your question into the Q&A, you can also raise your hand and we'll, we'll answer as many of the questions that are uh, through raised hand as we can after we go through the Q&A that's already in the list. Um, if you are listening on your phone rather than on a computer, in order to raise your hand, you can hit star nine and you can also hit uh, star six to unmute uh, once you're recognized as someone that we would like to answer your question. So hopefully we'll be able to move through that and, and you'll have an understanding. Again, put your questions in the Q&A at any time. Stefan will be monitoring them throughout the entire presentation. And at the end, if you have a question that you'd like to ask uh, directly, just raise your hand and we'll try to call on you. In order to start this presentation, uh, we are lucky to have Vice Mayor Pamela Beasley Pittman joining us the, for some opening comments. Commissioner, the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight to be a part of this webinar. It's a great opportunity that staff has put together tonight for us um, as a neighborhood in Meros Park. Um, just want to um, remind everyone what our objective is tonight with this webinar. Um, tonight is a conversation about, um, it's not about a conversation for improving the improvements that are coming for the storm water management in Melrose Park. Let me say that again. The conversation is not about the improvements of the storm water management that is coming to Melrose Park. However, our objectives tonight is to provide answers to how the system work, what the system does, and also to find out how we, the neighbors and the residents can help to make the existing system work properly. So with this, I wanna thank you again. I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Gassman. And um, as it has been explained, we'll follow the instructions how to um, pose our questions. Thank you, Dr. Gassman. Thank you so much, Vice Mayor. And we'll get started. So, I'm sure that many of us have been very focused on the events of April 12th, and there's been a lot of questions that have been asked regarding this, this event. The first thing that I'd like to say is that as of 2.45 in the afternoon on April 12th, 
there was three to four inches of rain predicted. And that is what the city was prepared to manage um, through that next 24 hour period. By 7 p.m., the downtown streets were completely flooded and blocked by stalled cars. And by almost 10 o'clock, we'd already received 18 and a half inches of rain. It wasn't until early the next morning that we realized that we had hit the 26 inch mark at the International Airport. And to give you a little bit of context, uh, this translates to 88 billion gallons of rain. And one of the things that the city was asked uh, when, when this rainfall started to create flooding problems is please send a vac truck or a pump truck out um, to remove the water. And to help you understand what this really means is that it would have taken 29 million pump truck loads to remove 88 billion gallons of water. And so we had to use a lot of other methods to try to address the flooding including time. And time ended up being a component that was useful in helping to reduce the flooding, um, but it also created other challenges for, for our residents. At the May 2nd commission meeting, we had a representative from FEMA who came out, that's the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And Mr. Mills stated that anytime you get 26 inches of rain in two days, it's going to flood your area. And that really underscores the challenge here is that our systems aren't designed to manage 26 inches of rainfall. Um, to be fair, no system anywhere in the country is built to deal with this much rain in that short a period of time. The neighborhoods that were initially impacted as part of the flash flood event uh, were primarily in the central and southern part of the city with Melrose Manors, Melrose Park, River Oaks and Edgewood being the, the greatest impacted um, of all of the communities. At least that was our, our initial assessment. Our fire rescue staff uh, went out and started doing some initial assessments. This is the dashboard that was developed showing specifically Melrose Park. And the city of Fort Lauderdale recognizes that any amount of water in one's home is devastating and that the great hope is that this will never happen again. But part of this webinar is to help you understand how your system works so that you can be better prepared for the future should we have a significant rain event coming forward. Um, as you look at this graphic of Melrose Park, I want you to focus in on some of the areas, um, these pink circles where we had clusters of impacted homes. And again, this doesn't represent every home that was impacted in the neighborhood. This was just an initial damage assessment. So if you focus in on those pink circles, you'll see them again in this next slide. This is elevation data for Melrose Park. And if you look on the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see the concentric circles that are so characteristic of Melrose Park. And you'll also notice that there's areas that are red and then there's areas that are gradiating to the blue. Areas in red are high spots within the neighborhood and areas in blue represent some of the lowest elevations. And the difference between the highest elevations and the lowest elevations is about four feet. Now here are those, here in the center, you'll see that the center of Melrose Park is very much the bottom of the bowl. There, there are many areas that are highlighted by that blue lower elevation. And here are those pink circles that showed you where those clusters were in the initial uh, flood assessment. And what you'll see is that those circles represent the bluest areas or the lowest areas in Melrose Park. So one of the things that we want to be able to accomplish today is to help you better understand how your system works and to set some realistic expectations. So there's really three main components to a drainage system. The first one is collection. Water collects in the swales between your sidewalks and the roadway, and it also collects in the catch basins that are, that are right at the edge of the road. The next major component is conveyance, and that's the pipes that connect the catch basins and the pipes that connect um, the catch basins to the ditch. And then the final piece is discharge, 
And there's a number of different aspects of discharge that we'll talk about regarding the Melrose Park drainage system. And one of the interesting things about the Melrose Park system is that the Melrose Park ditch actually performs all three of these major functions of a drainage system. It collects the water as it comes through the conveyance pipes into the ditch. It conveys the water. Um, once the ditch fills up, that water can move north toward a, a discharge point at Kentucky. And then the discharge comes in two different forms. The ditch can discharge into the groundwater and it can also discharge to Kentucky. And we'll go through each of these components separately. So many people don't realize that Broward County actually built the drainage system in Melrose Park as part of the neighborhood improvement project uh, as they were trying to get more and more of the unincorporated portions of Broward County to be annexed by the local municipalities. And you'll see that there's a green line that exits at Kentucky and goes north through the city of Lauderhill to the North Fork of the New River right across from the swap shop. And this is a major culvert system that was built to work with the system in Melrose Park to allow the water to move out. Shortly after Broward County constructed the system, right around the year 2000, Fort Lauderdale annexed Melrose Park and Lauderhill annexed Broward Estates and St. George. And so this unified drainage system was actually split up in some ways by being annexed by two different entities. So let's walk through the different components of the drainage system in Melrose Park. Well, first off, there are catch basins. There's actually 560 catch basins throughout the Melrose Park neighborhood. About half of them are connected to underground pipes that feed to the drainage ditch, and the other half are connected to exfiltration trenches. Many of you are familiar with the ditch that runs around the west side of Melrose Park. And under normal conditions with low intensity daily rainfall, these connected catch basins, which are the tiny green squares on the graphic on the right, convey stormwater to the ditch. And the ditch is designed to hold onto that water and to allow for it to do its first discharge function, which is to allow the water to drain down into the groundwater. And so all of these catch basins through these other areas throughout Melrose Park feed directly into the ditch. Now I mentioned that the ditch was designed to hold water, but once, once the ditch is full, once it reached a very specific elevation, water flows out of the ditch through this large structure at Kentucky Avenue, and it flows across Broward Boulevard into the culvert system that runs through Lauder Hill and eventually discharges to the North Fork of the New River. So there's another small portion on the eastern side of Melrose Park that services Alabama, Houston, and Arizona. There's about 40 catch basins in this system, and this group of catch basins discharge to the Broward County stormwater line on Southwest 31st Avenue. And then the rest of the catch basin system, the gray is the area that discharges to other locations, but the rest of the drainage system throughout Melrose Park drains to what are called exfiltration trenches. And these exfiltration trenches essentially allow water to move across the road into the grassy swales and then down into these catch basins. And the catch basins then feed into perforated pipe. Perforated pipe is just pipe with holes in it. And so the intention is to move the water as quickly as possible off the roadway and then it, these underground pipes allow for the capacity to hold that water. And eventually that water drains directly into the ground. These exfiltration trench areas are completely independent of the drainage ditch. And when the water table is very high or becomes saturated, these areas cannot drain 
and the catch basins fill with stormwater. So one of the, the questions we often get is, there's water in my drain, can you come pump it out? If we pump the water out when the groundwater table is very high, all that happens is the groundwater comes back into the perforated pipe and fills up the catch basin again. So at that point, we're pumping groundwater. We're not making progress in draining the area. Another component of the Melrose drainage system is the culverts. Everywhere that the ditch crosses a roadway, there is a culvert and the water will run underneath the road, underneath the culvert and out the other side. Um, the culverts are an area of concern, especially when there's a lot of debris in the ditch. These are areas that can become congested and blocked um, should the debris get across the mouth of the culverts. So the overview of the drainage system in Melrose Park is that there's many components uh, involved in this particular drainage system. It's quite complex. All of the components work together to provide drainage in Melrose Park, where the fundamental goal is to keep the streets passable. And then like most systems in the city, um, the drainage is influenced by the groundwater table. So one of the concepts that we work on when we design a drainage system is level of service. This is a, a baseline criteria that we use to guide how much stormwater system, how big the pipes are, how many catch basins need to be put in. And it's, it's designed to address high frequency, low intensity rain events, which means your typical everyday rain event. That is the design standard for the vast majority of stormwater systems. And again, the idea is to try to maintain the roads in a passable manner uh, for traffic. So most systems in, in the area, the existing level service is about three inches of rainfall. And as we are looking forward and building new neighborhoods, what we are trying to provide is a, is a higher level of service where the system can manage eight to nine inches and still keep the roadways passable. So I wanna give you um, a little bit of feedback on what happened during Tropical Storm Etta and the activities that we took to improve the system after Etta occurred. So in October, November of 2022, the city received 40 inches of rainfall in about 40 days. Initially in early October, the groundwater table was somewhat high and we were getting daily rainfall in the amounts through the 22nd of about eight inches. And then on October 26, we got a very intense rain event which dropped another six inches. And it was at that point that Melrose Park began to flood. And what you can see here is that uh, on this right axis, this red and pink box, this is where the groundwater table was below the surface of the land. And you can see that on October 24th, the groundwater table came all the way up to the surface. And this happened again during Tropical Storm Eta on November 7th and 8th. And so once we got a fully saturated condition, we could no longer drain water through the exfiltration trenches and the ditch could no longer drain water through the groundwater system. So because of the, the damage that occurred to the ditch because of Tropical Storm Eta, the ditch was completely reconstructed in 2021. New soil and sand was added to reestablish the design elevations and to improve percolation. That, that function where water that enters the ditch can drain into the ground, and then grass seed was spread throughout the ditch. Similarly, culverts were reconstructed with new rock and grade um, and new geotextile fabric to help consolidate and ensure that we would not have erosion near the culverts. And a, and a, a number of additional mitigation efforts were performed. Um, all the stormwater debris and accumulated silts were removed from the stormwater management system 
we cleaned out every single catch basin and we flushed every single pipe. The entire drainage system, the 2.5 miles of ditch was returned to its design specifications. The culverts were re-rocked. Many of the swales were rehabilitated throughout the area. The grate at the discharge point at Kentucky was replaced. And finally, we thoroughly inspected and cleaned the conveyance that goes from Broward Boulevard through Lauder Hill all the way to the North Fork of the New River. And we did that in conjunction with our friends at Lauder Hill. So once the ditch was rehabilitated, the question is, what level of service did it, did it now provide to the community? And our first real test following the rehabilitation in 2021 was potential tropical storm cyclone number one, which occurred in June of 2022. And over the course of that weekend, we received nine inches of rain. So when you look at the groundwater table, you'll remember that during Tropical Storm Eta, that the groundwater came all the way up to the surface. Uh, what we saw after potential tropical storm number one was that nine inches of rainfall was managed very well by the rehabilitated ditch and we did not see flooding in the neighborhood following a nine inch rain event. A few months later during another hurricane and tropical storm activity, we ended up with about six inches of rain in 24 hours. And again, the system along with the groundwater table were able to manage that event. And lastly, we got another six inches in a very short period of time in November. And once again, the ditch and the drainage system in general was able to handle that level of rainfall without causing any significant flooding uh, into the properties. And one of the things that we can conclude from that is that the rehabilitation of the Melrose Park drainage system resulted in, a, in an approved level of service for drainage for the community. But then came flash flood of April 12th and 13th. And once again, much like the tropical storm Eta, what we saw is that during the April flash flood, and that 20 plus inches that landed on Melrose Park, that the groundwater table became saturated. And again, 20 inches is well beyond the design specifications for this system. Um, once the groundwater table became saturated, this prevented areas served by the exfiltration trenches from draining. And it also caused overland flow. It was like there was a river of water and that swept additional debris into the drainage ditch. For the area that serves Alabama, Houston, and Arizona, the pipe, the Broward County storm line that they discharged to on Southwest 31st Avenue was surcharged. And what surcharged mean is that the pipe was completely full. And because it was completely full for, for several days following the event, there was no ability for these 40 catch basins to be able to discharge out of the neighborhood into their discharge point, which is that stormwater pipe on Southwest 31st. As I mentioned earlier, when, when the ditch fills with water, there's supposed to be discharge at Kentucky through the culverts along the north-south culverts that go to the North Fork of the New River. But in this particular situation, there was so much rain during that event um, <clears throat> that here's the rainfall that fell, and that was on April 12th. The water levels in the North Fork of the New River on both sides of the South Florida Water Management District's outfall called S33 became elevated. So what are called head and tail waters, both became elevated. And here's the discharge that comes out of those culverts that go through Lauder Hill. Until the water levels came down below five feet, we could not open up the gates to release water to the North Fork. And so discharge out of the ditch just wasn't possible until late Friday, April 14th. 
So our conclusions from the flash flood was that it was a highly unusual and ex intense rainstorm event that resulted in citywide impacts. The rain event substantially exceeded the design level of standard for not just the Melrose Park drainage system, but for all the drainage systems throughout the city. The groundwater table became saturated and that prevented drainage in areas serviced by exfiltration trenches and by the ditch from being able to drain into the groundwater table. The elevated water levels in the North Fork also prevented us from being able to open the gates and drain into the North Fork for several days. And again, reiterating that no improvements in the stormwater management system could have prevented this flood. The amount of rain that fell just was too great for any system as currently designed to be able to manage that amount of rainfall. Many people ask us about, you know, what are you doing in the ditch? You know, no one, no one ever cleans it up. No one is ever maintaining it. Well, that's not true. <clears throat> um, every catch basin in Melrose Park is proactively inspected twice a year. And based on those inspections, cleaning and repair is ordered. If we get a phone call to our 828-8000 number, that's the city's 24-7 customer service center, 954-828-8000, um, stating that something is blocked or that there's a problem in a catch basin. We also do reactive inspections uh, at those catch basins. Uh, in the ditch, litter is removed monthly. The ditch is mowed eight times per year. And twice a year, we trim any of the vegetation that's inside the ditch. Um, in addition, we added two other services in November of 2022. We added quarterly herbicide spraying at the culverts to keep the rock systems uh, weed free that are right around those culverts uh, that, that go under the roadways. And then over the course of the next year and a half, we'll be removing any trees that are currently growing inside the ditch. There are many things that the residents of Melrose Park can do to help us improve flood protection related to the Melrose Park drainage system. Probably one of the most important is to immediately report illegal dumping of debris into the ditch. Again, you can do that at the city's customer service center 24-7 at 954-828-8000. One of the other challenges we had during the April event was that there was so much landscape debris that had been dumped into the ditch, it impacted both the culverts and the grate at Kentucky. And I talked to a resident several weeks ago about the fact that, that residents are, are throwing their, their landscaping and vegetation trimmings into the ditch. And she assured me that that was not the case. When Public Works had an opportunity to come to the Melrose Park HOA meeting, I got to meet up with that resident again. And they said, you know what? I saw my next door neighbor throwing their landscape trimmings into the ditch. And what they told me was that it's biodegradable. What's the big deal? The big deal is that if we have a major event, those landscape trimmings that are getting tossed into the ditch are creating blockages, which are reducing the flood protection for the neighborhood. One of the other issues we have that is at the interface of the public private property coming into the ditch is that some people have put up second fences in front of old fences. And the area between the two fences traps weeds and grass and that creates both an unsightly and problematic issue for maintaining the ditch. And we would strongly encourage all residents that have two fences up to please remove the second fence that's no longer in use. And then the final issue that we're starting to have, um, which is going to start to impact our flood protection and our ability to maintain the ditch, is that more and more residents are putting up fences that are right adjacent to the culvert system. The city can only access the ditch by going around one side or the other side of these culverts. And if there are fences on both sides, we will no longer be able to access this part of the drainage ditch and we won't be able to perform maintenance. So if you're considering putting up a fence, please consider giving the city a 15 foot easement so that we can make sure that we can get our equipment in the ditch 
and continue to maintain uh, the ditch to the current level of service that we've discussed. One of the most important protections that you can provide for yourself is to have flood insurance. Again, the FEMA representative that came to the commission on May 2nd basically said, if you live in Broward County, you need flood insurance. When you look at the flood zones on the right side of the slide, the blues require flood insurance and the orange are the 500 year flood plain. And you can see that they're very close together. One house on one street may be required to have flood insurance and the person across the street may not be required to have flood insurance. When you overlay the impacted houses that were part of our fire rescues first assessment, you'll notice that they, these impacted homes were not specifically and exclusively in the flood zones. Many of them were just outside the flood zones in an area that doesn't require flood insurance. And the last thing that you can do to improve flood and your own flood protection and your own ability to respond to these types of emergencies is to sign up for Alert FTL. As soon as the city was aware that this rain event was causing, uh, was going to cause a great deal larger effect than we originally uh, had originally been forecast, we started to put out messaging on Alert FTL. And these are either text messages or uh, recorded messages that come directly to your phone that lets you know that there is something going on and that you can have as early a warning as possible um, for us to be able to tell you that there is an issue happening in your community. So the conclusions on how you can help improve flood protection in Melrose Park include reporting illegal dumping, keeping your landscape debris out of the ditch, removing your double fencing, ensuring that the city has access to the ditch to make sure that we continue our maintenance activities, get flood insurance, and stay informed. So that concludes the main portion of the presentation. And I'd like to give Vice Mayor Beasley Pittman a moment to make some concluding comments. Thank you again, Dr. Gassman, um, for the presentation. Um, this presentation, um, I do believe, gave us some answers to concerns that we have. It gave explanations as to um, how the system worked and also what the expectations of the current um, system that we have. Just wanna also remind our neighbors that um, Dr. Gassman did also give us that um, customer service number, which is the eight, um, 954-828-8000 number. It is also a great resource when we do have that, um, those storms that come about and we do have to make those phone calls. So we all know what's going on, where it is being documented so we can get that immediate um, help as needed. Also, I want to say that, um, that this conversation um, is one that was needed and I'm glad that you brought it forth um, after the conversation with the HOA um, in Melrose Park. Their request, it, it was heard and we were able to bring this to them. And also I wanna put out there um, the phone number to my office. If you have any additional questions later after this particular uh, opportunity that we have tonight, our phone number is 954-828-5680. Again, that's 954-828-5680. And Jamil Walker, um, she's my assistant and she'll be able to take your um, calls and also answer the questions that you may have or direct you in the right area. So um, with that being said, again, thank you to the staff with everything that you all prepared for tonight. And I know that we now have room for the question and answer session of this webinar. So I'm gonna uh, mute myself and allow you for us to go forward with those questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, my Vice Mayor. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, um, Dr. Gaskin, if I can say one other thing as well. I'm just reminding everyone that this, this conversation again is strictly about the current um, system that we have. There is improvements that are, um, that's being discussed 
And this is not overshadowing that. This is also in conjunction to what is to come with improvement. So please keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gassman. Thank you very much, Vice Mayor. Um, Stefan, I can see that we've had at least eight questions into our question and answer queue. Um, would you like to start with the first question? Uh, yes, ma'am. So there are some concerns on storm drains that still need to be serviced. Can we talk about the city's catch basin cleaning operations in Melrose Park since the storm event and maybe uh, next steps for residents who think a catch basin needs to be serviced still? Great. Um, Marie Pierce is on the line and she can um, give additional answers to that. Following the storm, we've had over a thousand requests for service of catch basins. And please keep in mind that the city has over 10,000 catch basins. Um, we're currently having an internal conversation to try to get additional resources out so that we can get all catch basins serviced. Um, but Marie, if you could address the catch basin, the current level of service that's going on in cleaning the catch basins in Melrose Park. Marie, are sure. you on with us? Yes, I am. Go ahead. Okay. So um, as a matter of fact, I was working with the maintenance chief this afternoon. Um, currently we have 742 open work orders um, that we're sorting through to figure out how we're going to dispatch. Um, we have dispatched just short of 500 locations. Um, so at this point, just as Dr. Gassman had mentioned, we are uh, trying to come up with a kind of a map section plan that will enable us to centralize our efforts and be a little bit more strategic in how we can um, schedule the resources because obviously it's still continuing to rain every day, which means that every day we get more calls. Um, so I would say that if you do have a concern for an inlet or a catch basin at your location that you do call the 8,000 number, um, they will put it into the customer service system, which will come to all of us. Um, but we're we're very well very well aware that Man Melrose Park needs to be inspected and cleaned. We just have not figured out, based on the current activity level throughout the community, how we're going to specifically schedule resources in each of the neighborhoods. But we are actively pursuing that effort. Thank you, Marie. I think one of the things I'd like to point out too is that following the major flooding, flooding unwatering. Um, which took the city about six days. One of the, the next things that we did for the next week was that the majority of the stormwater operation staff were working in the Melrose Park ditch uh, to try to clear debris and to improve the flow into uh, that system. So yes, there are catch basins that we haven't had an opportunity to clean, but we have done a focused effort to make sure that the ditch is functioning as well as possible. Stefan, your next question. Yes, um, so the next question revolves around how the city knows that different areas are flooding. Do we have any other devices or ways to know a neighborhood's flooding besides customer phone calls? So that's a, a great question. Um, one of the things that we rely on very heavily, uh, in addition to getting those phone calls uh, into our customer service line is that when we have an event like this, our staff immediately go out and start to canvas various neighborhoods. Um, and I can tell you that following the rain event this afternoon, um, give me one second here, following the rain event this afternoon, uh, staff were already out taking pictures in Melrose Park to see what the impacts were of the afternoon rain events. Um, so this is a picture near Florida. Um, noting where the wa there's water on the road, noting where there's ponding. And so our staff, not just in stormwater, but our staff in the building department, our staff in fire rescue, anyone who's out there, police department that sees an issue, <clears throat> calls it in so that we can be aware that there is a concern in any given location. Um, and again, since we've just given you this, this webinar, here is a picture at 620 this afternoon following that afternoon rain event. And you can see that our groundwater table 
um, still has quite a bit of room in it to continue to take on that rainfall. Okay, Stefan, what's the next question? Uh, there are comments on potentially using pump stations. Are they being considered and would they stop these types of floods in Melrose Park? So the answer to the second part of the question is no amount of infrastructure could have prevented the flooding that was caused by a 20 inch rain event. But I'm gonna let our public works director take the first part of the question, which is, are pump systems being considered and what are some of the activities that we're looking for to possibly improve the drainage systems, not just in Melrose Park, but across the city? Colonel Dodd. Uh, good evening. So um, as we all know, we have a stormwater master plan and we have started uh, already designed seven neighborhoods. We are working on the design of Melrose Manors and we have started construction into the neighborhood. Uh, and that is all part of tranche one. We are currently having conversations about the next series of neighborhoods and the next effort to update the stormwater master plan. Uh, none of this has been started yet, it's in the early stages, but we will be looking at doing a more comprehensive uh, look at the entire city to see where we need to be focusing our efforts next, which neighborhoods, which flooding problems, should we be incorporating uh, additional uh, features such as pump stations? We're at the very early stages, but nothing has been solidified yet uh, regarding any of the neighborhoods at this time. So that, that is something that we are still having conversations on. Okay, and um, the next question, there are a few comments stating that the drainage system seems archaic and needs to be constructed for today's climate. Are there options to increase the amount of water in the drainage system and how much it can hold? Interesting question. Um, I think that would be one of the options that we could potentially look at. Um, as noted earlier, the previous systems were built looking backwards at our former climate and targeting three inches as the core um, activity. Um, when, when the uh, questioner states that this system seems archaic, um, this is one of the most, the newest systems in the city because it was built in um, 20, right, right around the year 2000. And so it's actually one of the newest systems that we have um, in the city itself. Um, Marie, do you have any comments that you'd like to add about potentially increasing capacity? I think capacity in the in the ditch is is basically what it should be for the drainage area that it it hosts. Um, capacity is something that can sometimes be a little bit of a, of a challenge because of the groundwater table and because of the headwaters that are currently in the district canal, which is C uh, excuse me, C12. So I think there are opportunities, but I think that they really need to be analyzed from an engineering standpoint because we would have to take in overall hydrology. Yeah, uh, this is Alan. I, I would like to add on to that. Uh, uh, we do need to look more at, at understanding groundwater levels, how we monitor those and how it may impact changes. But this system is designed to handle more water than the majority of the city, which is only designed for that five-year level of storm. One thing that we can do and, and we are working on is uh, as we realize the impact of canal levels, and on the ability to drain water. When the, uh, the North Fork of the New, of New River is too high, we are, weren't able to discharge on it. So having better uh, communication with the South Florida Water Management District, with adjacent communities in Broward County to manage water more holistically so that we have greater ability to put water into those systems to drain down our, our neighborhoods. Thank you, Marie and Alan. Stefan, are there any more questions in the queue? 
Yes, um, can maintenance of the ditches be improved? And there are some comments stating that we need to increase our code enforcement of the ditch. Yeah, I'm going to let Marie handle that one. Um, I know that she's been working very closely with code enforcement regarding some of this illegal dumping. So, Marie? Stefan, could you repeat that? You were cracking up a little bit on my end. I apologize. No problem. Uh, there, can we? Um, I'm sorry, can maintenance of the ditches be improved? Some of the comments are stating that we need to increase our code enforcement of the ditch. Wow, so that's a pretty comprehensive question. Um, the, the ditch is two and a half miles, and I've been working in this ditch since 2006 in one way or another at various positions throughout the city. And I can honestly say that um, as it stands right now, we probably have the most comprehensive response. Um, we work with the homeless portion of the police department. We work with public works. Um, we have extended our contracting services to address all different types of debris. Um, in addition to the litter that gets picked up, uh, we work very comprehensively with code enforcement. Um, and we're really at a point now where we are asking for public outreach and you know, saying, please help us help you. Um, I think there's probably always something else that you can do, but I'm pretty confident that if we see something, we say something and we you know, respond as quickly as possible. Um, I've, I know I personally, it's frustrating for me. Um, you know, we'll go through the ditch right behind the inspection team and we'll everything will be clear and we'll literally come back the next morning and there's a couch. So will it ever end? Um, I don't know, but I do know that we are definitely aggressive about it. We probably visit Melrose Park with the stormwater inspections team ourselves at least two to three times a week, whether we're looking at inlets or whether we're looking at the ditch or whether we're just doing routine stops to make sure that along the, what I call the high highway corridors, the 441 and the Broward Boulevard areas where it's easy for, easier for people to come in and not necessarily go into the community and dump, but they're right there behind Bank of America, they're right behind the hotels. So I think it's just something that we're, going to have to continue to be diligent about. I, I wish there was perhaps a better way to enforce. We do get the police department involved where we can. Um, we have been successful in a couple different cases to actually find out who did the dumping and the police department has gone after them. And, and that, that sometimes helps us, you know, with future, future dumpings, but I, I don't know that we'll, it will ever stop. Um, it's continued since I've been here. So I don't know that that answers your question, but it's honest. Yeah, so thank you, Marie. I think I think part of the important um, response in there is we need the neighborhood to also have no tolerance of putting debris into this ditch and to make sure that as soon as you see it, it gets reported because the sooner we're able to get out there, either code enforcement um, or the police department is able to get there, the sooner we are, the better potential we have to identify who's causing um, this illegal dumping. And so having a, a, a no tolerance level, not just for city and city staff, but for a neighborhood to say, this is enough. We don't want any more of this in our neighborhood. Please report illegal dumping whenever you see it to the 828-8000 number and educate your neighbors on not throwing things over their fence into the ditch. We need your help and we need your eyes um, to be able to observe what's happening and call us and let us know it's, it's occurring. Stefan, are there any other questions in the queue? Yes, ma'am. Um, so we have a resident who has lived here for about 30 years and they have noticed a uptick in flooding both in 2020 and 2023 and in the previous 25 years there was no flooding to their house um they're asking you know what is the difference now and why are we seeing this excessive rain yeah so 
the rainfall, these, these extreme rain events in part are due to the changes that are associated with, with climate and the impacts that greenhouse gases are having on our climate. You know, at any, at any time we could have gotten a, a hurricane that would have dropped 10 or 12 inches of rainfall on us. Um, and I think part of what feels unusual is that we're having these rain events independent of these tropical storm or tropical events. And that what is what really feels different. Um, during that 30 year time frame, when I've looked at the rainfall record, up until, uh, I believe there was an event in the early 2000s or maybe in 1999, where we had a significant rain event, but it is only recently that we've had these really intense rainstorms. And again, they're, they're associated with an expected outcome of climate change. Drier dries, wetter wets um, are all part of how our weather systems are gonna continue to change. And so we may not have another 10 inch rain event for 20 years, or we could have one tomorrow. Um, it's really becoming much harder to predict when we're going to have this type of impact associated with extreme weather. Next question. And um, there are quite a few comments about where they can go to learn about the future plans and the improvements to the drainage system. They're especially concerned that these uh, rainfall events are not uh, contributed to a hurricane. So, um, you know, how can our residents figure out the improvements that are coming? Great, great set of questions. Um, the quickest answer is the city has something on their website called Lauder Works. And Lauder Works shows you all of the capital improvement projects in a, in a map-based format so that you can hone into just Melrose Park and say stormwater projects in Melrose Park, and it will show you whatever stormwater projects are currently in the five-year capital improvement plan. Um, that won't tell you necessarily what's going on with the planning. Um, this is a topic of great interest to the commission at this point in time. And so my expectation of the course of the next six months is that Public Works will be giving regular updates to the commission regarding their, our current planning for stormwater improvements uh, moving forward. Um, and they can always request that information from the, their commissioner's office and staff will provide additional support to answer those questions. Alan, is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, just uh, that we, we are, you know, we have been very focused on the tranche one, those first uh, eight neighborhoods. And now we are starting to have the conversations about the next group and the rest of the city. Uh, there really isn't any documents as such to read on those. It's something that we are developing and, and we will be working to uh, inform the commissioners and get guidance from them over the upcoming months as to the direction that they want us to take for future investments. Great. Stefan, we do have some people with hands raised. Are there any other questions left in the queue? Uh, yes, I have one question left and it's... Um saying that you know there's a theory that new construction on the east side is negatively impacting older neighborhoods in the lower lying areas um do we have any information on hydrology and is this water that's impacting the floods in melrose park is that coming from different neighborhoods and moving over or is it just from rainfall yeah so the city has 10 different drainage basins and those drainage basins have significant lines that prevent the water from moving from one basin to another basin. Um, so the Melrose Park neighborhood is, it's very unlikely that they are being impacted by construction activities in the east. Um, either Elkin or Marie, if you wanna make any other additional comments regarding that. Hearing none. <laughs> no, this is Elkin. There's there's no other watersheds that um, also contribute to the Melrose. Melrose Park is a stay right on the neighborhood. Yeah, so Thank you, it, yeah. yeah, only the development that's occurring 
immediately in the neighborhood would have any impact on the movement of water across the floodplain within, and when I say floodplain, I just mean the land um, within Melrose Park. So generally, no, the development in other parts of the city are not impacting the ability of Melrose Park to drain. So if but that was your water, But groundwater does play a significant impact with Melrose Park. Correct. But groundwater is not a function of development. Uh, not the watershed, no. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah. Uh, Andres is our moderator. He, um, Raymond Saunders, has his hand up. Um, are we able to unmute Mr. Saunders? Yes, hi. Good evening, guys. We can hear you. Yes, okay. So um, I have a couple, well, two questions here, if I may get it in. Um, so you mentioned um, the uh, gate at the Laurel, that's a runoff. And, um, you know, you guys say that um, if you add more pumps uh, or if you put pumps in a the system, then that still wouldn't make a difference. But I noticed that that night that we had the flood, I went right across the street. And yes, we did have the, a lot of rainfall, you know, that's, that's understandable. And there was a lot of flooding. But the issue is that the water is supposed to run off after the flooding. And in Melrose, the community of uh, Melrose, that, that wasn't the case. So my question is, um, can you explain a little bit more about that uh, Lauderdale uh, gate where the water uh, runs into that uh, um, where the water runs in that area? Sure. So Raymond, the there are two paired seven foot by seven foot box culverts. So imagine two giant parallel underground culverts, seven feet tall by seven feet wide that run the entire length of Lauder Hill uh, and out to what are called sluice gates. And the sluice gates can only be opened if the discharge point on the North Fork of the river is at a certain elevation. So we had the entire capacity of the, of the seven by seven box culverts available. We just couldn't open the gates to discharge the water that was in those, those gates. And currently those are gates, they are not pumps. Um, again, Elkin, if you want to jump in and, and provide any additional explanation for that. Um, no, other than um, we obviously are depending on the tailwater, the water at the canal, and if the canal's water is higher, then there won't be any water moving through those culverts that Dr. Gasman explained. Um, but, uh, but it is important for the community that... Uh, to know that the city in the process of the restoration in 2020 it completely um, rehabilitated the capacity of those culverts. That is very important moving forward. And um, it is, uh, I felt very good actually that we were able to find a couple of spots that um, needed improvements. Um, there were a lot of debris that was removed. So from a community standpoint, it's it's fair and, and, and safe to say that those culverts are working to the capacity. And moving forward, it's just a matter of coordinating activities between the cities, between Fort Lauderdale and Lauder Hill and the district, which is the entity that uh, regulates that canal uh, right next to the um, Sunrise Boulevard. Yeah, and Raymond, I, I just want to further the comment that our biggest challenge to unwater the various neighborhoods was being able to find a discharge point where we could put the water to. Um, and that wasn't just a challenge for Melrose Park, it was a challenge across the entire city, where whether we were serving it with pump trucks or moving pumps into the area, we still have to push the water to somewhere. Uh, and that was a challenge across across the area. Um, it's a little bit after eight o'clock. We have two more people with their hands up. I'd like to take their questions. And those will be the last two questions uh, of the evening. So Michelle Knob, you have your hand up. Um, if we could unmute Michelle and let her ask her question. 
Hi, um, in my storm, in my catch basin in front of my house, I can see water in it. When I look in it, it's about, looks to be about eight feet down. Is, is that normal? That is normal. That I can, okay, all right. Cause I didn't think it was at first, but if I understood what I just heard you say, you would expect to see some water down there and what until it's absorbed, <laughs> excuse me, or, or flows, is that what the process is? You, you have taken the lessons from this webinar quite well. That's exactly okay. correct. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Okay, um, Jamie Degal, I believe um, we've, we've had one more person raise their hand. Those are the last two questions. Um, Jamie Degal, if, if we can unmute Jamie. Go ahead, Jamie. Uh, Jamie is still muted. Jamie is still muted. Hey, Jamie, you're gonna have to unmute yourself on your side. We've allowed you to talk. Um, there should be a button on the bottom left that says mute. Jamie, if you could unmute yourself, we would like to take your call. Yeah, it looks like he's trying to unmute and is it continues to have a problem. Um, could you put your question quickly into the Q&A so we can answer this last question? Stefan, are you getting an additional question coming into Q&A? No, not yet. Okay. Um, it's, uh, he stated dredge or she stated dredge the drainage system. Yeah. So the, the ditch was completely rehabilitated in 2021, where we removed all of the muck, uh, out of the drainage system. That drainage ditch was completely, we can use the word dredge. It was dredged um, and it was restored to its uh, original design specifications. So that was done in 2021. And we know that that made a difference because it didn't flood in June of 2022 when we got those nine inches of rainfall. Um, that's our last question. We really appreciate everyone's time this evening to learn about how the drainage system works. Um, again, this has been recorded. If you wanna go back and review the information, it will be posted to our YouTube channel, City of Fort Lauderdale uh, YouTube channel uh, in the coming days. Thank you so much for your time. And if there are any significant concerns that require uh, a response in terms of a work order, please call that in to our customer service line at 828-8000. Once again, thank you for your time this evening and have a great evening. <laughs>